welcome to our Bible class for June 14th, 2020, and we are looking at the gospel lesson for today from Matthew chapter 9, which reads as follows. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly that the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. And he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over the unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these, first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, Raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without pay. And we'll pray together the collect for today. Almighty, eternal God, in the word of your apostles and prophets, you have proclaimed to us your saving will. Grant us faith to believe your promises that we may receive eternal salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, so before we get into the gospel lesson, we'll look at the context, the immediate uh, verses preceding this, and uh, Jesus has just been doing a lot of healing. Um, so we first get the miracle of the healing of the hemorrhaging woman, um, the woman who's been bleeding for years, who reaches out to Jesus and grabs the hem of his robe and, and is healed. Um, although actually that one takes place kind of in the middle of uh, the healing of the ruler's daughter, and we find in other Gospels that uh, the ruler's name is Jairus. But Jesus is uh, messenger comes and tells Jesus that the daughter's sick, and that as Jesus is going, the hemorrhaging woman uh, grabs him, and then after that, then Jesus raises the daughter from the dead, um, and everyone rejoices. Um, and then after that, then Jesus heals two blind men, um, and then he also heals a, a mute, demon-possessed man. Um, and so throughout this week, so we've seen Jesus doing a bunch of different healings, uh, drive, drove out a demon, um, raised even someone from the dead. Um, so he's been doing a lot of miraculous things. Um, people are starting to talk about it, but he especially tells the two blind men not to tell anyone, um, but they don't listen. Um, that's part of what we usually call the messianic secret, that idea that, Jesus tells people not to tell others about what he's done for them. Um, and while there's different ideas on why that, why he does that, sometimes they think it's some sort of reverse psychology sort of thing of, well, if I tell you not to tell someone something, then of course you're going to. Um, it's more that it was, uh, the timing wasn't right, that Jesus didn't want things to get uh, too, want to draw too much attention to himself before the time was right. Um, and that idea of timing is going to come up in this section we heard as the gospel lesson. Um, one of the commentaries I look at calls this then the narrative introduction to the missionary discourse. Um, so what that's uh, some fancy words there, that, um, but it's just kind of serving to transition. The, this chunk we're looking at is serving to transition from the miracle stories then to Jesus sending the disciples out, sending the, the twelve out um, and telling them what to do and then the results of what they are going to hear and that's what chapter 10 is all right so it begins the section we're reading at begins with the people are being are harassed and downcast why well there's a, a bunch of reasons um, you know so a lot of which don't necessarily seem all that different to why people would be seeming harassed and downcast today um, but essentially one of the big things is that the leaders aren't caring for the people like they should um, and that includes the Pharisees, 
um, the religious rulers who are supposed to be caring for the for the people of Israel um, and um, are not are more concerned with their own cleanliness than necessarily uh, with sharing God's love with the people they that need to hear it and also the Roman rulers um, you know that that uh, Jesus is is up in Galilee um, but it's still important to remember uh, in Jesus time that it's he's in occupied territory and so the people have little to no voice in in what their rulers do uh, who they are um, any of that kind of thing um, and so they're harassed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd um, and so once this as the people gather around him then Jesus is moved with compassion or moved to compassion um, and the word that's used there um, I even got to figure out a Greek font to show you all here today um, but, but it's es, es plagnizothe so es plagnizothe um, is the form of the word and it liter literally means uh, moved in the guts um, that for um, for for the for the Jewish people moved in the guts is kind of the same way that we'd we talk about feeling things in our heart um, so it's it's, a, it's the seat of emotions it's where uh, where we you feel things very deeply um, but this verb is only used um, in the New Testament in the synoptic gospel so in Matthew Mark and Luke um, and it's only God is the only one it ever you is d described well sort of we'll we'll see here so the other times it's used um, the parable of the Good Samaritan um, the forgiving master and the prodigal son um, and then the prodigal son it's used of the father when the prodigal son comes home that the father's moved with compassion and then runs to go to go meet him um, so it's used to do the, the verbs used to describe how God is acting uh, moved with compassion uh, moves very deeply um, and so Jesus then does what he does um, and then after after he does that then he starts talking about the that the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few um, and of course the harvest workers are he uses in a few times and a few other parables that are will come up later in uh, in Matthew here uh, workers same kind of word described about the slaves um, in the parable of the wheat and the weeds um, so he's talking about just the, the everyday people he's not talking about um, a different words used to describe um, if you remember the parable of the wheat and the weeds um, that uh, it's the weeds planted um, enemy comes in and plants weeds that look like wheat uh, in among the things and the workers are all upset and the landowner says don't worry about it let everything grow together and then we'll separate it out at the end um, and so the slaves are the ones who are caring for all this stuff now and then you know the, the angels represent the those who come and you know separate the wheat from the chaff separate the wheat and the weeds later on um, and harvest workers of course also in the parable of the workers in the vineyard um, where they get called at different times all up but all get paid the same all right and so as Jesus is talking about this then he's giving his authority his his, the, his disciples uh, the, the 12 the apostles authority um, and so they're given authority over unclean spirits and could heal every disease and every ailment so it's not just being able to drive out unclean spirits um, that are causing diseases but also healing other diseases other ailments that are not necessarily caused by uh, unclean spirits um, and it's important to note that this isn't something they're doing on their own but they only have it have this authority to do it because Jesus gave them the authority um, we see that today and uh, when we use one of the confessions and ab absolutions from the from the hymnal from the liturgy uh, either pastor Mark or I or whatever pastor is doing it says you know as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority so the the authority isn't isn't our own it's that it's Christ has given it to us um, to do do such things and that's what Jesus is doing here with his with the disciples with the with the, the 12 all right um, and then here in 10 in uh, Matthew 10 verse 2 it's the only use of the word apostle in the Gospel of Matthew um, and 
sometimes we seem to use the word disciple and apostle interchangeably because we think it refers to the same 12 people all the time. Um, but it really, it really doesn't, um, and they mean slightly different things. So a disciple is a student, um, whereas an apostle is someone who is sent. Uh, and so, um, so the, the disciples are the ones that are still students, and Jesus is their rabbi, their teacher. They're following him along. They're, they're learning. They're um, being mentored, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, whereas an apostle is someone who's sent, and so uh, it's used here because that's what's going to happen to the twelve that Jesus is sending them out. Um, so they're apostles and they're w ones who are sent. Now, why why would he choose 12? Why there's, well, symbolically, of course, there's 12 disciples or apostles, and that uh, relates to the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, each of the Gospels have different emphases. Um, they all have the tw uh, 12, 12 disciples, 12 apostles, that key group. Um, but symbolically, it kind of connects to the 12 tribes of Israel um, that God's still working in that way, um, and so uh, so that's why there's why there's twelve because that's the number of tribes of Israel, and showing that God's making a new people um, this way. Um, so next time you're in the building, or you probably recognize this, some of you, um, this is the the clock in the back of the student center, um, and around it are uh, there's shields. Uh, there's 12 shields, 12 o'clock, um, and each one represents a different apostle. Um, some of them are pretty easy. Um, so this is, um, you know, noon. 12 o'clock is Peter. Uh, his, his cross is upside down because that's what tradition says he was. Um, he was crucified upside down. He didn't feel he was worthy enough to have um, to die the same way Jesus did, and, of course, and he has the keys because uh, Jesus uh, gives him the keys of the kingdom. Um, down here we talked about last week, um, we're reading the Gospel of Matthew, um, and so Matthew gets the three money bags because he was a tax collector. Uh, the sideways cross is Andrew. Uh, St. Andrew, we see that a few times with, um, um, with stuff from, from England. Um, and here six o'clock is uh, Judas's shield and it represents the the blank shield um, that was was someone traitor, someone uh, who fell in battle, kind of lost their coat of arms. So that's why that's the way it is. Um, and so we'll look quick at the at the name at at the list that Matthew gives us here. So of course, first first he gives us Simon Peter and Andrew. Um, and here you see the picture of Peter from the um, uh, from from the front of the front window of the main sanctuary here and uh, he's listed first but he's uh, really just first among equals um, you know he doesn't get any special real credit um, for that um, he acts as spokesman or and as um, one of my the commentaries that I looked at said described him he's the representative blunderer um, so Peter's of course the one who just says what everyone else is is thinking but too polite too tactful to um, to actually say out loud, um, whether it's the sure I, you know, we'll we'll follow you even to death, um, and then deny Jesus three times, or you don't really have to go to the cross, do you, Jesus? Right after Jesus tell, starts telling them he's going to have to, um, and some other things like that. Um, so he's yeah the representative blunderer, you know, when um, and serves as kind of the spokesperson for the disciples, um, and then Andrew, his brother. Uh, then James, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, um, who get, get called with Peter and Andrew from, from their fishing boats. Um, they get the, um, they're the ones who, uh, they and their mom ask to sit at the right and left hand of, of Jesus when he comes into his kingdom. Um, so they get, um, and the yeah, sons of thunder, they kind of get a little uh, uppity at times, a um, little, little, flashes of temper and things. Um, but then James is the, the first one martyred, first of the 12. Well, not counting Judas. Um, and then John, uh, tradition tells us, is the one who dies last. Um, so they do end up kind of serving as bookends, not quite the way they thought. All right, so Philip and Bartholomew, and, the, um, and then Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. So, of course, this is Gospel of Matthew, so uh, we 
know about know that about Matthew and uh, Thomas really gets get, we learn more about him in, in John's gospel and he gets stuck with that doubting adjective um, after e after Easter uh, James son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus I uh, don't know a whole lot about them um, and then Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him uh, I've noted this a couple times over the last few weeks as we've looked at at Matthew, but um, so the Zealots were the um, political party or p group um, that was uh, trying to overthrow the Romans. Um, they would, uh, you know, try and cause rebellions. Um, they were really strong in Galilee, where uh, Jesus and the uh, most of the disciples are from. Um, and so, you know, the fact that Simon the Zealot and Matthew, the former tax collector can get along shows us a bit about how people from different backgrounds, different political ideologies, things like that can um, can get along and Jesus shows us that even among his disciples like that. All right. All right, we won't cover the whole thing, but then that gets us then into what's called the the missionary discourse. Um, so then Jesus is set apart these 12 and now he's uh, sending them telling them what to do and to refresh your memory this is what it says here so these 12 Jesus sent out instructing them go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand heal the sick raise the dead cleanse lepers cast out demons you receive without paying give without pay and that's where our reading ends, but uh, it keeps going for a bit, and we'll read a little further. Uh, so acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. All right, so as we're looking at this, reading this, it seems kind of odd to us because why would Jesus tell us the, send these 12 not to the Gentiles or the Samaritans and tell them to avoid it? Well, um, part of it is... Uh, that this is uh, the, the timing and the scope of the mission. So he, Jesus is only sending these 12, um, and he's sending this um, somewhat early in his, in his ministry. Uh, and so he's just sending it to, he's only got a limited number of people. He's not wants to give them some focus. Um, so Israel's lost sheep only confined until 70 AD. So Jesus is starting uh, with the people who are confined if the, uh, the Jews are going to only be in, in Israel um, until 70 A.D. when they, the revolt finally starts in 66 A.D. and the Romans army comes in and destroys Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Um, and so after that, there's not a whole lot of uh, Jews, not a whole lot of Israelites uh, in, in the area um, until, uh, you know, after World War II. Um, so... If you're going to try and reach out to the Israelites, um, go, you know, this is the time to do it because they're all confined. Um, and this is also just to the 12 that we'll, we see the Great Commission later, and that's for everyone. Um, also part of it is that Jesus is sending the, these disciples to people they're used to dealing with. Um, that none of, none of them really seem, aside from, from Matthew, uh, as a tax collector, would have had some contact with the Gentiles, but... Um, but for the most part, these are these are the disciples are Jewish. Um, they they were raised Jewish, so they know know though he's, Jesus is sending them to the kind of people they know. Um, you know, when Paul gets sent later, yes, Paul's Jewish, but he also grew up in Tarsus, uh, you know, in uh, modern day Turkey. So outside of w where it was just Jewish people, um, and so Paul is able to kind of uniquely straddle, um, you know, have a foot in both both the Jewish and the Gentile worlds, whereas the disciples don't. Um, in fact, if you remember, um, in Acts 10, it takes God giving 
Peter a vision before he'll start talking to Gentiles. So again, so Jesus sent, gives them this uh, little commission, so to speak, um, just to the people of Israel because that's who they're comfortable with. That's who they, they are like. Uh, it keeps the mission small um, and the, the Israelites are only going to be together. Or Jewish people are only going to be in this area for so long. Whereas if we'd have, if we had followed the uh, the lectionary and celebrated Holy Trinity um, last week, uh, we would have heard the Great Commission, which is wh how Matthew ends his gospel. Just to remind you of how that is, and so then now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so um, the idea of that the make disciples of all nations, the Great Commission, um, we'll see that with the disciples um, then after Easter, and even more so um, after Pentecost, um, which would have celebrated two weeks ago. And when we, but when Jesus uh, sends, he tell the he tells his disciples who are watching, waiting for him to ascend. He says, "You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria." And to the end of the earth, so the, they'll even when when the Great Commission comes, even after Easter, they start out in Jerusalem, then they go to all Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth, or to the end of the earth. Um, and so they start small, but and gradually will go go out. Um, you know, tradition tells us a bunch of the, of the the apostles went to um, various uh, different places. Uh, Peter and, and Paul end up in Rome. Um, John's on the Isle of Patmos um, in the Mediterranean. Uh, Thomas, tradition tells us, went, makes it to India. Um, and some of the others go to other places. All right. All right, and so again, the apostles aren't using their own power, but the authority that is given to them by Jesus uh, in the same way um, that we, uh, the pastors today, go as a called and ordained servant of the word and by his authority. So it's the same idea of the authority they've been given to go and do these things is not, it's not because they're special, but because of the authority given to them by Jesus. Um, they're also sent out without supplies, uh, which gives them a couple things. Um, it first makes them and helps them to trust in God to provide, um, and also then gives them the opportunity that those who believe will be grateful and provide. Um, so there's then they, there's go out and without anything this time, and then uh, trust in God to provide for them. And then that's all that benefits them as they grow in faith, as they realize God will provide what they need, um, but also then gives the opportunity of those who hear the message to be able to um, respond in a tangible way and provide for their needs. Uh, rejection, though, of course, is, is pretty bad, and uh, Jesus even says here that the rejection of the apostles was worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, if you remember that story from the Old Testament, they uh, from Genesis, uh, both those cities are destroyed by uh, fire from heaven. Um, a lot of debate over why exactly they're des they're destroyed, um, but their their sin is great is is definitely the, the reason. Um, they're punished, Ezekiel later tell, says they're punished for their pride, their greed, and their indifference to the poor. Um, but also, and most uh, in, we see in Genesis that they're, um, they're punished for their, for their sexual sins. And so, um, but again, these two cities destroyed by fire from heaven, um, we tend to place them uh, where, by around where the Dead Sea is today, which is the lowest place on the earth. Uh, little to nothing can grow there, um, that kind of thing. So uh, for Jesus to say that rejecting the apostles is worse, they'll, villages will be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah is pretty big. Um, 
but the the promise of grace and forgiveness is still there and um, goes along with the message too and we'll we'll stop there for today um, but so we'll close with then uh, the collect for the word let's pray uh, blessed lord you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning grant that we may so hear them read mark learn and take them to heart that by the patience and comfort of your holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life through jesus christ your son our lord who lives and reigns with you in the holy spirit one god now and forever amen <laughs>